to the Home Tech Podcast for Friday, April 29th. From Sarasota, Florida, I'm Seth Johnson. And from Pickering, Ontario, I'm Gavin Campbell. And welcome to the Home Tech Podcast, a podcast about all aspects of home technology and home automation. This week, we're going to got a couple of new products this week. Uh, things are coming out again, which is nice. Uh, and it's great great to see. Like, we've got a couple of new products. And for, first up, the, the Innovelli. Uh, Gavin, it's kind of a, I don't know, not, not, I think we talked about these before, the Blue Series that we talked about on one of the shows. They're up for pre-order now. Yeah, they've been working on this for a while, and the Blue Series is the Zigbee version of their Switches, and these actually look really good. I know their Z-Wave versions are very hard to get right now, but these Zigbee versions uh, will be available soon. Um, just some of the things about them, they run on Zigbee 3. They're both a dimmer switch and a switch switch, like uh, an on-off switch, which is smart. And you can distinguish them by just the number of LEDs that are um, lit up on the bar. So on a regular just on-off switch, it'll just be one block, where on the dimmer, you'll have the full bar. So that's actually a really cool thing. Um, they're fully customizable, just like their current existing switches. And the other thing I really like about them is Zigbee binding. So if you're a Z-Wave person that uses associations, that's this is the Zigbee version of it where you don't even you can bypass the hub when you flick on one switch it could trigger a whole bunch of other switches instantly so it works with only some hubs though right now Hubitat and uh, Home Assistant are confirmed not smart things but they're up for pre order if you're looking for some Innovelli switches go grab them now yeah I mean great, a great price forty five dollars and it's it's smart to have one SKU so you don't have to figure out like is this dimmer compatible with this that and the other and like and then oh i don't need a dimmer i need a switch but i bought a dimmer and now i'm kind of yes. stuck with this dimmer and it doesn't work with this fixture no it's just a setting you turn it over and now it just turns on and off which is which is a smart really really smart idea like i'm not i don't really know of anybody else that has done something like that but this is is i wonder if it's is it a setting in software or is it like yep. physical wires or a jumper that you have to do uh, everything's configurable through software through the driver right um they also allow some settings to be configure configurable on the device itself just by pressing the config button so many times but you know if you want the full uh, you know everything you have to go through software yeah no that makes sense that makes sense i, I do like the the binding uh, where you can group it in with with everything and uh trigger things without having the hub just bypassing the hub altogether it's it's kind of like what we talked about with insteon doing that in the past i think you can do that with z-wave already i think we've talked about that i i do that it's called z-wave association so i associate switches with each other and honestly it's instant because it doesn't go through the hub it's a, as fast as you flick that button the other one re, re, um, responds so it, it's worth i really like it the only problem is that you have to be all z-wave or all zigbee you know right. to really take advantage of that between the devices right right now makes sense makes sense well if you like those 45 dollars uh you and you get 450 reward points for whatever that's worth uh that you save up those reward points uh, what do they send you a free sticker or something i don't know <laughs> no i think you can use uh reward points they were giving them out for a while but you can use it for future purposes purchases i think yeah so you know like build them up why not yeah exactly why not why not see that's people people some people like that and uh you know 450 it's 450 reward points there you go <laughs> not nothing <laughs> all right uh TJ, tj's off this week he uh scheduled an install on top of the uh the show so uh that's fine that's fine we'll, we're, we're gonna record and have a have a quick show with without him this week but uh that's what we need to talk about so what do you say we jump into some home tech headlines let's do it all right all right well the party is over for ava well, not really. At least for dealers who were planning on using uh, the AVA with their Control 4 system. Uh, according to a support article posted on the AVA website, Control 4 has somehow blocked the AVA app from running on the remote device there. Uh, Snap One's contr- Here's a quote from the, the article. Snap One's Control 4 app currently does not work on some specific Android devices, including the AVA remote. This is unpleasant uh, for the Control 4 in the customer and Control 4 dealers alike, especially as it would work perfectly. <laughs> Snap One deliberately broke their app for the Ava Remote. And the article kind of goes on to be a little more snippy and in, in saying, you know, there's only one company in the entire industry that's doing this, and it's Control 4. Uh, I don't know. Like, we, we speculated that this, you know, th- this could run, like, up, a, like, Control 4 could look at this product and say, that looks like the Neo remote. And, and it was made by the former Neo guy, the, the uh, Raphael who made the Neo remote 
they sold the control for, they worked there for a little bit, there could be some kind of like legal thing in play here, um, which, you know, control four may not like. And then they say, well, we're blocked. We're going to take our cookies and go home. <laughs> so, uh, I, I was, I was saying before, like we should have a drama button. We could put a drama button on our, on our, our, our little labels here. Um, what do you, what do you think about this? Have you seen anything like this in the DIY space? Oh, you see it all the time with these companies that are like, you know, bickering and fighting, you know, like you can yeah. even like in all industries, even between Amazon and what was it? YouTube, Google. Apple, or, or, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, and in the end, the only people that get hurt are the, the consumers in the end. Right. We're the ones that get hurt in this case, specifically TJ. He got hurt, you know, like it, I, I'm not I'm not a fan of this. I don't like the fact that they did this. I understand, you know, like just sue them and get some money instead. But keep things working. If, it, you know, I feel bad for the integrators that may have installed some of these and now things don't work and they have to go back and fix it and spend their money and time. Right, right. I, I don't know how many or if any could have been installed so quickly because I, I mean, this is like just within a few weeks of them officially launching that remote. Um, I, I don't know that they have been sold or installed yet, but they may they may have been. Um, but it, it was definitely a, a beta product. Interesting that it, it had gone to market if there is some kind of like legal NDA or something in play and not just, you know, Control 4 being kind of, you know, whiny about it. I, I, I could see, like, I, I don't, I don't understand how this could possibly affect control four other than sell more control four gear, because like if you don't want their push button remotes with the, all the buttons on it, you would not get that. And if you didn't want their near remote, which looks similar, mind you, but doesn't have like the, it, the near remote still has hard buttons on it for like the Rosetta control up, down, left, right has volume and channel on it, all that good stuff. This one doesn't like, it's just, it's just a, a slab of glass with a little bit of extra battery space on it and a camera or not a camera but a, a microphone and enough to basically record you know a podcast off of and, and tj has joined a couple of zoom sessions uh on the remote too so that was quite funny but yeah i, don't, I really don't see how this hurts control four this is like it's intentional like if you're gonna run this remote like what does it break and take away from control i don't i don't know it's like there's no intellectual property there may be some trade dress issues like with the way it looks because it it looks similar and has the same industrial design as as the near remote and if you put them side by side you're like oh yeah maybe it's made by the same company but i don't know like very very strange hopefully they can work it out i guess I'm sure there's more to the story that will come out in the coming weeks. But uh, if anything, it hurts Ava more than anything. You know, if any yeah. installer was considering this, they might just hold off now until all this gets sorted out. Yeah. Well, Control 4 is one of the bigger companies on the block um, where <laughs> consistently dealers don't like their remotes for some reason. I absolutely <laughs> love the hard button Control 4 remote. I'm not, I mean, I, I understand the Neo exists uh, and it's a Wi Fi remote. I just don't like using Wi Fi for that. I like to use Zigbee. The Zigbee stuff just works great works perfectly every time and it's kind of a known quantity and the remotes you can drop them and they don't break um i don't know about the neo i'm pretty sure if you dropped it in the wrong way or my daughter dropped it on the hard tile floor or something it, it would break because it's glass same thing with ava uh so i really do like the plastic <laughs> push button button remote that that i don't care too much about and i've got cracks in, in in plastic broken off like all of them that i have in the house every one of them has got some kind of scratch or plastic on it so uh broken off on it but um yeah th that would be my favorite to go to but i i know that a lot of guys don't like those remotes and don't like how they look everybody's opinionated right everybody doesn't like especially when it comes to remotes especially when it comes to gavin's remotes and he has to have it logitech so <laughs> i have to have buttons that's, that's yeah all i want is like the button all the buttons well not all the buttons but enough buttons i don't five buttons is not enough no 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 the apple <laughs> it's funny i have this remote for the lights here <laughs> i picked it up thinking it was the apple tv remote because it, it's got it actually has five buttons on it which is you know just about as much as the apple tv remote has but yeah more, more than five buttons um screen is for me is optional uh it is like the the control for remote that has the the 250 and and the uh and the uh, 260 that that i have uh the 250 is the older version of it but still they, they have these little like oled and led screens oled like yellow screens perfect like 
that's all I need. I just need to look down at the remote and see maybe like what source is selected and that kind of thing. Don't need anything else. No, I totally agree with that. When it comes to a screen, like I, I could do it without a screen for the most part, but the screen is great for those functions on like an AV receiver or something that, you know, a button doesn't make sense, you know, like no one would ever know that button did that. Then you can look down on the screen and do something like toggle subtitles, for example, right? Like it makes so much sense to have, it doesn't have to be a color, you know, a screen. It doesn't have to be, have icons and be pretty, you know, a black and white screen. Like I'm perfectly happy with that. I just want to see toggle subtitles on the button next to it. That's it. Yep. I don't have to be, I'm, I'm never happy when I look at the control for remote. Like it doesn't give me like, um, the screen doesn't, doesn't make me like super excited, you know, to look at it, but it's, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is the functionality and the utility of having that screen there. And it, it's also for like dynamic things. Like with the control four system, um, I can turn on off the lights with it and it, it has a little icon on the side. That's just, you know, a couple pixels, but it shows me the lights on or off windows are open, closed, that kind of stuff. Um, and they not only do they have their visual navigator that you get on the TVs, but they have what's called list navigator. And it's like super, it's probably one of their oldest APIs, but like it still works with everything and it's fast and it works great and it's reliable and I love it. <laughs> that's the important stuff, fast yeah. and reliable. Yeah, it doesn't have, I mean, it doesn't have all the features that the, um, you know, graphical would clearly, but it's, it's just a, it's a few lines of text and it's simple to transmit over Zigbee and it, it works really well. So I've been super happy with that, you know, as, as long as I've owned control Four gear, uh, and, uh, the list navigator API is just, I mean, it's ancient. So I remember there was actually, um, you know, those business phones, like the Panasonic business phones that had the little screens on them. Um, if you worked in a corporate office, you've probably seen like a, a phone that has like a, an LED display on it. Yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. It's kind of like, yeah, imagine just, that. Yeah. Corporate phones. And uh, the Panasonics had like up, down, left, and right and an enter button on it. And and Control 4 actually pretty early on ported that list navigator API over to the phones. So you could actually connect the Control 4 system to the phones and and use that list same same list navigator that you had on the remotes so you could go through and turn on and off your lights with it was kind of a pain but it, it, it worked it worked it worked it was reliable <laughs> it's simple it was fast you know those are the same fo- uh, phones that all had the same ringtone i think to them that you're talking about From the jack bauer ringtone yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> 24 <laughs> <laughs> if i if i uh if i have time i'll edit that into the the show here but all right. Well, we're well, moving on. Hopefully they get that resolved. But uh, and, and and Ava can can move on with what they're doing, because I, I think it's 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 not like it doesn't subtract anything from control for it's, it's additive. Like if, if you weren't happy with the neon neon that the neo remote and how few buttons it has, it's not that you're going to go get this one that has less buttons. But if you wanted less buttons, it, it was either like use your phone or use this remote shaped phone thing that they say is not a remote. <laughs> So hopefully they get it resolved and cooler heads can prevail or whatever. I don't know. Um, maybe maybe there's some maybe there is some kind of legal, legal non compete or NDA or something that was violated. We'll find out. Work it out. Yeah, work it out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, moving on here. Netflix had a pretty rough week <laughs> along with Ava. <laughs> and at the same time, they pretty much lost their minds. Uh, the company reported the first subscriber loss in more than a decade, dropping 200,000 subscribers in the first quarter of 2022, followed by a 35%, I think it's gone even more, price drop in their stock. So uh, the stock market was not happy about their, their loss of subscribers. Uh, in a letter to shareholders, Netflix put part of the blame on its failing numbers for people who share their passwords uh, for the service and, and non-paying viewers. So um, family members who may share a login, you know, and say you log into your Netflix and you see, oh, there's my sister-in-law's Netflix. And I, I completely forgot that we had shared it with them, you know, five or six years ago. They use it, you know, just as much as we do. Uh, but yeah, Netflix is blaming uh, that kind of use of their service uh, for uh, bringing down their uh, losing subscribers and not the fact that there's absolutely nothing to watch on Netflix most of the time. Uh, anyway, uh, Netflix also announced that they would be uh, bringing commercials to a new ad supported plan uh, here in the future. The, this comes about a week after Disney confirmed that it would launch an ad supported tier for Disney Plus. 
is not very uncommon in the industry. Uh, HBO Max, Hulu, Peacock, Paramount Plus all offer an ad supported plans at this point. So it now looks like Netflix will be joining that party uh, here in the near future. In the meantime, the company expects to lose another 2 million subscribers in the second quarter here. And I can tell you they're high on our chopping block because there's there's really not much to watch. Stranger Things isn't out. And it's like a month-to-month service. It's not like I have to have a plan. I don't have to sign up for it. I can cancel anytime I want. Come back when there's something to watch. What do you think, Gavin? Are, are you are you going to... Uh, I mean, you're all... You just watch open source videos at this point. You're not watching... <laughs> You're not watching anything from Netflix. Uh, I'm, I'm only watching podcasts and stuff like that right now. Um, YouTube uh, rabbit holes. We go, you know, like it's amazing. You can click on a Facebook video and two hours later, you're still clicking on Facebook videos. You didn't realize, you know, and I've I've been sucked into that a few times. It hurts um, two hours. I can't get back. But, you know, I somehow enjoyed it. In terms of Netflix, though, okay, somebody pointed out one. They also cut off Russia, right? Um, I wonder if that was factored into this at some point. But are they counting more than one login as more than one subscriber? Like, I would think the subscriber is, like, the one person paying, no matter if they share their password or not, right? Um, Because if they're blaming that, then they're counting subscribers, you know, how many people are actually logging in to the same account at that point, which doesn't make sense to me. Because it's only one income coming in. Right. And one of the things they talked about doing was perhaps, uh, I think they're running like a, a, a program somewhere in a couple of other countries where um, you have the subscriber account and then you can have like s- the sub accounts that you have hanging off of it that are actually people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they 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 pay like an additional X amount. I, I, I also saw that they were limiting the devices that you could play to like four which or or whatever, whatever. You, my, in, in our case, it was four. And my wife is freaking out that they're going to start charging us. So she was like, I'm deleting all of this stuff. And like, but it's going to be a couple months before they announce whatever the pricing is. But she deleted, you know, all the devices off the thing and is telling people they can only log in over here and here. It's like, well, let's just wait to yeah. see how this falls out. But um you know, if it gets too crazy and 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 they limit on where, see, that's the problem. That's the biggest problem is if they charge you per client rather than per like login or whatever. I have a problem with that because that like I have an iPad, an iPhone, a computer. I have two Apple TVs in this house. You know, uh, my sister-in-law may have her Apple TV and her phone that they use it to watch their net. You know, their login off of. So it's kind of like okay, well. It, those devices add up really quick. And if they're going to charge like three or four dollars per device, I'm I'm gonna jump off the system too and and look for open source videos as well. Like I'm not gonna spend my time dealing with this and, and this madness of like it's it it's too much friction. I, I it make it, they've made it easy for so long that like, yeah, I don't care that there's nothing to watch on Netflix. Most of the time I'll just pay the 15, 20 bucks a month. And I, right now we're watching Disney Plus. Yes. Right. I'm not watching Netflix uh, very much on Netflix. Um, so like, I'm not going to miss it if we cancel it and come back to it when Stranger Things cranks back up or something like that. But and that's know. a big I, thing right there. The competition's huge right now. Disney Plus is, yeah. uh, you know, uh, taking a lot from a lot of other streaming services. You know, there there's a lot of like, and they're all being isolated now in their own little, you know, streaming service that you, you're pretty much. We're, we're going back to the cable days, you know, <laughs> where we're going to be paying for packages and then we're going to be, you know, paying to watch ads like. Netflix is doing all the things that I don't want to hear them do. So inserting know, right. ads, inserting ads for a cheaper price, it's going to be cheaper for now until they do their next price bump. And then you're back at the same price and you still got ads, right? So it's, they're making all the bad moves right now. I think people are getting out to with COVID, you know, restrictions being, you know, locked, you know, loosened a bit. People are starting to get out now. Um, they'll probably lose some subscribers because of that, you know, but the account sharing thing is a big part. I think they should leave that in. You know, there's many relationships that never split or, or, up. Or not blame blame like that on why they yeah. lost you know so much money. That's not why they're losing money. They're losing money because they have competition now. Of real, so that's, there's like you said, there's great stuff to watch yes. on other places. That's why they're losing money. Yep. 
it, it, it's big. People share uh, the logins. I know it's a big thing, you know, because, you know, some people don't even break up because he doesn't want to lose his Netflix login. So he stays with that girl to keep that login. Um, you know, things like that happen because it's Netflix, right? Like it, it became the brand name streaming service, right? I don't think it will die, but it needs to do the right things right now to, to keep, you know, relevant. Right. Right. Yeah. I, it, like you said, all the wrong, all the wrong moves here, Netflix. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, there, there could be somebody who wants to pay uh, less for an ad supported version of Netflix. That's fine. It's not me. I don't want to see ads. I don't like seeing ads. When I go to like Hulu or something and crank that one up and there's like a couple ads, no matter, you know, I think, I don't even think you can pay for ads to not be in Hulu. Like eventually they show you ads. Um, at least last I remember, but I, I don't want to see ads. Like, I'm not, I'm not here to see it. What's, what's so funny is like when we go somewhere like to a, like a hotel or traveling or we go somewhere that would like actual TV is on. And my daughter is like just transfixed into like the commercials. She has no idea or no concept of what is going on. <laughs> and there's like, there's kids playing with these toys on TV. When does this happen? <laughs> she has, I mean, it, 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 I know that they're designed for kids to, to like, to, to be absorbed into, but like for her, it's just even like a million times worse because she doesn't have any concept of, of there being a commercial in the middle of a cartoon show that she's watching. And so when it happens, it's kind of, it's really funny to watch actually. Yeah. So, <laughs> And the fact that they expect to shed another two million more this quarter, that's kind of scary, actually, you know, that they see that coming. That's a much more that's a much bigger number than the 200K. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. It's a huge number. Um, I think some of these policies are going to scare that they're announcing. You're going to scare people off or or something. I don't know. I would like to see. Here's what I, ideally I'd like to see um, a Netflix that doesn't cancel really good um shows because of some algorithm said that people aren't going to watch it, you know, later on, like it would be nice if they didn't do that. Like just cancel, like after a season or two, like, I don't know, Cowboy Bebop. That was, that was a fun show. And I know that it wouldn't like, didn't take off or whatever, but like it was, it was decent and it was a decent sci-fi show. And there's not many of these out there at this time. And I would like to have seen like a couple more seasons, you know, out of the thing, but they canceled it. And when you do when you do that, it's like, well, why bother watching the first season? Like, I don't want to get invested in these characters if they, I know that they're not going to have a second season. So that show, instead of being one of those cult classics, you know, where they come back and say, oh, man, we made a mistake and renew it, uh, never gets a chance because some algorithm told them that it, it was going to be canceled. That's what's hurting them more than than the than anything in the, in the competition, because Disney isn't inventing anything new. <laughs> They're taking they're taking Marvel. Hey, look, Marvel's turned on today, but they're taking like Marvel. They're taking the Star Wars franchises and running, you know, more stories out of those. Um, they're just reinventing the wheel over at Disney. They're not doing anything crazy. Uh, Netflix has had some really good quality first run content uh, and, and they've been successful at it. But the problem is that they cancel it if it doesn't perform. It's if it's not like knocked out of the park and you can have those. You can have those super hits, right? Um, Stranger Things, uh, Mandalorian, like you, you're going to get those from time to time, but to, to expect like this, the whole company to do that every single time, or I don't know, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Put, you're going to have to put some bad, con like, I don't need to see another Adam Sandler movie. I'm thankful they exist, but they're not great. <laughs> like, you're thankful they exist. <laughs> I mean, it, there's something, some like the one they did. Uh, when did they release that one with uh, Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston? It was like a dumb, like half spy movie or something. Um, it was like released over a Christmas holiday or Thanksgiving holiday or something like that. And there was absolutely nothing else to watch. And they just planted it right there. And then everybody was watching it that Friday because there was nothing to do. Um, so it, it was just, that was perfect. Like that's what those movies are for. Um, they're not good, but they exist and, and, and see how well an Adam Sandler can movie can do Like he's not, no, that's, that's a horrible, <laughs> it was a horrible movie, but it did great just because you put it in front of people and you let them watch it. Same thing goes for the TV shows. I mean, man, just, just make some nice TV shows and keep them. Keep them. Don't don't spend billions of dollars or millions and millions and millions of dollars on the first season and then just be like, yeah, not going to do it anymore. I'm done. That's my advice. Uh, I don't run a billion dollar company, but 
I do like to watch TV. So <laughs> yeah, and I find a lot of the Apple Plus shows coming out now are really good, giving them a run for their money. So I've been watching a number of those and enjoying them. So I don't. They'll figure it out. I'm pretty sure they'll figure it out. I'd like to see them go more into some live stuff. You know, like start. You don't have to broadcast live TV channels, but broadcast the events. So if you have the Grammys or the Emmys or whatever, broadcast those on your channels, you know, like work out what you have to work out, you know, get more into sports. Sports always seems to be one area that a lot of people are lacking. Yeah. If TJ was on here, he would be like, I don't, I don't care about the sport. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I saved that for when he's not here. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, uh, hopefully Netflix figures it out and, and gets around to, uh, to putting out shows that people actually like. And keeping them. So moving on here. Uh, according to The Verge, Sonos is nearing the release of a new entry-level soundbar, codenamed, and I keep reading this as Furry, so from now on, it's Fury, but I'm going to name it the Furry. Uh, the Sonos Furry. Um, it's officially known as the Model S36. Furry is a better name. All right, so the new device is yet another soundbar that will join the company's lineup, but priced beneath the $450 Beam and the flagship $900 Sonos Arc. So the, the new furries expect to sell for around $250 and should be released in a few weeks, sometime around June 7th, uh, they think. The Verge has a few 3D renders based on photos they were able to obtain, and it looks like a, sm- like a, it looks like a smaller soundbar. Like it looks, it's smaller than the Beam. Um, rough, roughly the same depth and everything, but it's got fewer speakers in, inside of it. Uh, it kind of looks more, to reminds me more of like a traditional center channel speaker, but it's, it's still got some width to it. Um, it should come in both, you know, all the colors, like black and white, <laughs> that you've come to expect from Sonos. Uh, it, it's going to hit that $250 price point by taking features like Dolby Atmos uh, and that HDMI input out. So those are gone. It's going to have the, you know, standard optical input like the old Play Bar did. Um, but it also has, this is kind of interesting. I, Sonos is going to expect to sell some of these uh, as surround sound speakers for to be paired with like the higher end arc. Um, and if you if you look at the renders that they have there over the verge, there's like these cone speakers that like face up and down. And I have to wonder if that's like to build in a better Dolby Atmos soundstage because Dolby Atmos likes to bounce things off the ceilings or at least have speakers in the ceiling sometimes. Um, and that's a big part of getting that height is part of that Dolby Atmos system. So maybe that's what that is going to be, but it would be interesting to pair this in with like the Sonos Arc that can do, or I think the Beam might be able to do the Dolby Atmos as well. Uh, and then have these as just rounds and then have a Sonos sub sitting there. Have a pretty good surround system, I think. When reached for comment, a Sonos salesperson said, we, we don't comment, or a Sonos spokesperson said, we don't comment on rumor or speculation. So pretty cool product, though. What do you think? Uh, aren't they having a Sonos event coming up soon? I thought there was something coming up. There's usually one once a yeah, year. I yeah, I think there was yeah. one coming soon. Um, and this was probably going to be announced at it, if anything. But I, I see a space for this. I will probably grab one. This is good for, you know, not my home entertainment system, but for adding some better sound to my other TVs that are in smaller rooms. I don't need surround sound. I don't need all the fancy. I just want something that sounds better than the speakers that are in there. And I want it to be, in, it's nice that it's in the Sonos ecosystem for multiple reasons, right? Um, the lack of a voice assistant, I really wish there was one in there um, just because of, uh, you know, eliminate one other device in my room. It's nice to have like the voice assistant built in. I use that a lot. Um, the lack of HDMI, not a huge thing for me um, because again, this is just, you know, extra in a smaller room, right? Like this isn't going to be a main entertainment system. You know, I, I can see myself grabbing one. I already know a TV that I put it on because I just hate the sound that comes from it. Right. Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be big, but it's interesting that the use uh, case for surround sounds, that's a very interesting thing. I just don't know how it would look in that vertical position. We'll see how, you know, when someone actually does this, how that will look. Right. Right. I, I, I it would be interesting it'll be like you said it'd be interesting to see that i i think that if if you need the hdmi input that's where they're hoping you step up into the 500 hundred dollar beam right like you you get that one instead and this one is is for like just the smaller systems i i was looking at this i'm like oh this would be perfect for my garage here because we we have most we have one one sonos speaker out here um 
and but we hook the garage sound system to the let's see, it's going through the Apple AirPods right now. And you know, putting in a Sonos system isn't terribly difficult, especially in here. But it would it would be nice to be able to to connect it up. But looking at this, I'm like, well, it could have be the HDMI cable. Or it's got to be this optical cable. How am I going to get you know? Since it's a projector, it's kind of different how this all runs and sets up. And I'd have to get like an optical decoupler to put between the Apple TV and I don't know. It's like, well, maybe the beam is <laughs> better. <laughs> like after you start getting all these like little ancillary things that could fail and not work, maybe just get a beam and and call it a day. So I don't know. Um, like you said, it, it'd be good for those TV rooms, rooms with TVs that you won't have Sonos in, but don't necessarily have, um, you know, great audio coming out of the TV or a soundbar that exists. I'm, I'm half. I, I might get one. I wish they had. I wish they did have like a smaller price, smaller, lower price sub, I guess, because I think the sub is like up to nine hundred dollars now. Yeah. Yeah. The sub is the one thing I've always, you know, I, I don't know why they're charging over a thousand dollars Canadian for a sub. Um, I don't know what that's going to rock, but I think, uh, they need a cheaper version of the sub, you know, just something that like doesn't destroy your home, but just gives you that extra little, you know, vibration. Yeah. I mean, the sub is a good sub. Um, I remember turning it on the first time and thinking, oh, wow, like all said and done, this is going to perform, this performs as well as like the $2,000 subs that we were installing left and right. And it's got a different, not a smaller footprint. Cause we were putting in some smaller, like cube type subs. And like, I think they were like eight by eight or something like that. But this one, like you could slide it under a couch or you could put it next to an end table. Like it didn't really stand out like those square subs that we were, we were putting in as custom integrators. So it, at the end of the day, it worked out better <laughs> than, a, than a custom, you know, a, a, one of the square, bigger subwoofers. Um, even if it didn't quite perform as well as some of like the higher end ones, it it definitely works it, it, on par with some of the bigger, you know, fancier subs that I, that I put in my life. And like the convenience and everything of just walking in and plugging it in and pressing a button and it working all the time instead of having to like balance out the receiver. And then, oh, the power went off and the receiver got reset somehow because the kids were pushing buttons on it. And it's like, can you come back out? and re No, like the Sonos thing is already done. It sets up. It works. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I mean, for I think at the time it was like six ninety nine. I think there, it's up a few hundred bucks now. But um, I, I have no problem with the price point there. But you're right. You, you need something. You need something like that would pair with this, right? At two hundred fifty dollars, maybe a maybe a two hundred fifty dollars sub. Yep. Yeah. You, know, you know, just something something easy. A uh, little small eight inch down firing box thing doesn't have to be pretty. Doesn't have to have that high gloss finish that you know. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I remember when they came out with the sub and we would put them on order and they were just like, oh, no, uh, we're not going to have those for a few months because of the, the, the finish. They 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 really take their time spraying and sanding and all. And I'm like, well, just make it matte. Like, come on. <laughs> like, no yeah. one cares. This is going to collect dust bunnies in the corner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. We're well, moving on here. Uh, we've got another new product possibility from Ecobee, uh, everyone's favorite thermostat with a completely broken API. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they've released a new iOS version of their app and somebody decompiled it and found a hidden image, what could be a new smart thermostat with an indoor air quality indicator visible on the screen. And also um, some descriptions in there that say uh, things like keep your home's air clean with the new smart thermostats built in air quality sensor and uh, your sensor is calibrating your home. So there's a couple of references to this sensor in here. Ecobee has not publicly announced a new smart thermostat. So no additional details are available at this time. No idea on a release date or anything like that. I, I actually, we're, I haven't heard anything. So this is like breaking news to me, even as like an Ecobee distributor that they usually show us new things on pretty, pretty early on. So <laughs> I can say, I don't know when this thing's coming out. Um, let's see. Uh, this, this, this could be, uh, they're not too sure even on the features of what this would have, but the idea is possibly that if the air becomes stagnant inside the house, they'll turn, um, you know, the, the fan on to kind of recycle the air through a little bit better to get the air moving around. Um, and, and at least alert you that your, air in, your indoor air quality might be, you know, bad at that point in time. Gavin, what do you think about this? You're going to grab one of these and a couple of air filters? I don't know if I'll grab one. Air quality sensors seems to be um, the new big thing in the industry. I'm seeing them all over the place now. Um, just 
left, right, and center, everybody's talking about, you know, bad air quality, opening windows, etc. You know, I also feel like the, the thermostat market has kind of been a little like stagnant. Just standing still. Yeah. yeah, stagnant for a little while. Um there's only so much you could do with a thermostat, right? So but Echo B seems to have found, you know, hey, maybe we add this in now. And I'm pretty sure they'll have new little sensors and the sensors will probably have the the air quality sensor built into them as well so you can get your air quality from all around the house you know in different rooms which would be smart um i think it's a good play it's another reason to get people to be buying a new thermostat i probably wouldn't get them because i don't know i'm i i haven't been convinced about this air quality thing yet yeah right like um i i just don't know um We'll see. The, well, I'll see what it does. There's actual. I mean, unlike the circadian rhythm light thing, that seems to be the most popular thing that a that a that a trade industry editor could love, uh, and and literally no one else. <laughs> like, uh, that, that there's actual science behind air quality, <laughs> and then, like okay. it's actually a measurable thing that like you can tell when there's you know enough either particulate matter or organic matter or whatever inside in inside air and they can measure that and there's they can tell you what the adverse health effects are that over time um uh, it's it's very well studied and documented and all this stuff um so i mean it, it might be good for maybe not here in florida like we generally have pretty good air because the beach is always blowing in you know clean air from the ocean or whatever but i mean there there's some places that are landlocked or i'm thinking like even other markets like in china you know where you see like they have those really bad smog days from the pollution and everything kind of hanging around the city uh this would be a good thing for people in those markets um to to have the ability to just kind of have an alert or the some kind of automation um plugged into the thermostat that could trigger you know turn on filters or that kind of thing if if it got to uh uh, to to um, I, and that's kind of like what I'm going with this. Like, I wonder if Ecobee Ecobee's been pretty innovative. They always try things. Like, I'm wondering if they aren't going to uh, bring something like a indoor air filter system to market. You know, they 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 they've just been bought by Generac, I believe, is what they were. So yeah, it's a new parent company. They make they they've never been afraid over at Ecobee to try things out. Like they have um, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was like a a, a light switch or something that had. Alexa built into it. It's like a little speaker. Yes. Yeah. And it was just a light switch. But I mean, it kind of made sense. Like if you were going to have that in the room, it probably had a, you know, a really horrible like sound, <laughs> sound to it like as they talk to a little one gang light switch. But it, it, it seemed pretty good. So um, it seemed like a pretty good idea. But I, you know, it was coming from Ecobee, a smart home thermostat, smart, smart thermostat company, not like Lutron or, you know, Lutron Caseta or Inavelli or somebody like that. You know, like it was already established in the lighting control as a lighting control brand. So um, I, I'm curious as what they bring to market. Either this comes to market with just a new thermostat. Hey, it's got this built into it. Or maybe they have some other products that are, they're, they may try and bring in around it. Maybe interesting to keep an eye on. Yeah, most definitely. You know, I just don't want them to do try and do too much with the thermostat because the thermostat's just in one room on that little wall. Um, when they added the home assistant to it, that actually made some sense because that's one less other device in that room, right? Right. Um, so I'll, I'll see. When this comes out and it's officially announced, I'll see what it can offer. And maybe I'll upgrade. I have like one of the early generation ones. But, I mean, it works. It does what it has to do. I don't see any reason to really change. Yep. I'm kind of, kind of in that boat, too. Like I have one of the very first generations, and they have like... The new ones have like you can get the Amazon built into it. You can get the Siri built into it. You can get the Google like it's got all the voice assistants built on them and newer screens and they they look good and uh, it, all it has to do is cool the house. <laughs> it does a pretty good job yeah. of that. So I don't really have to worry about anything else. It's like in a in, in my house. It's like in this like na- tiny little hallway, kind of pushed off to the side. It's not like I ever have to look at it. It's it, it would never even be you can't see it unless you're like go into this tiny little hallway that connects two bedrooms. So uh, it's not a showpiece like I think they want it to be. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> Thermist ads. All right. Well, all the links and topics we talked about tonight can be found on our show notes at hometech.fm slash 385. All right, Gavin, speaking of air quality, we've got a pretty good pick of the week here. The canary spelled with, well, the most awful way you could possibly smell canary. It's got eyes upside down and eyes right side up and, 
this is a little Kickstarter that you can go to. And what <laughs> this is an air quality monitor that has a little bird sitting on a stick that sticks out of the wall. And if the air quality gets too bad, well, guess what happens? The bird turns upside down and dies. <laughs> And there's a video of this. Like, I'm not, I'm not doing, you should really go see this. Like, this came out like last Friday, I think. And I was like, happy Earth Day, <laughs> I think. <laughs> the, 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 it's actually funny to watch the poor, you feel bad. Like, it's I an know. emotional it's a cute reaction bird. when the, yeah, when it <laughs> dies, you know, you're like, oh man, open up my windows, bring this thing back to life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and when I first, you know, I, I thought of the canary in the, the, the coal mine thing. Right. And that's what they base this whole thing off of. Right. So I was like, ah, oh, it's smart what they did. <laughs> Just watching it go up and down <laughs> on their website. It's so awful. <laughs> it's his, his little wings like hang down <laughs> under like he's upside down yeah. hanging with his feet. And his wings are you have an emotional reaction to this bird dying, <laughs> right? Like, oh man, it's happy so Earth Day! Kickstarter never ceases to surprise me. I'm like, <laughs> they'll come up with here. So, uh, of course, it's got like an app you can control things with. I'm sure there's an API or something along with it, but um, I don't know. I thought the visual element to this was just hilarious and wanted to share. I just don't know where you'd mount something like you just mount it on a random wall in the room or. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be more visible than my Ecobee. I can tell you that. Like, I'm going to put this thing where people are walking. In the room. What's this dead bird for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's too good. How much is this thing? I, I didn't even click through to to see how much it was going to be. Oh, it's in a different price form here. So let me just scroll through. It's it's 970 DKK, which translates to 150 $39 US. Wow, that's expensive. And $178 Canadian. There you go. Um, you going to grab one of these? <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> you, you know what? Sometimes I just don't want to know because I can imagine my wife walking in and this thing's dead on the wall. And then she calls 911 due to the bird dying and there's bad air quality and she can't go in the house and all sorts of trigger. You know what? I just don't want to know. Like, uh, I don't right, think right, so. right. Because if you were in the coal mine and the canary was dead, this means don't go in the don't go in the house, right? Well, yeah, this is like the canary being dead on this thing is like worst case scenario. Like if the canary is dead, you should not be in this room. No, right. No. Like 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 if the canary was just gasping for air, you know that would have been a different sign. It's like all right, something's up, but we're not going to die here. They they need to update it with a gasping canary. I'm I'm sure that'll be on the round round two of the Kickstarter. So like $130 US dollars, you can go back this Kickstarter campaign and, and maybe on the next version, if they make enough money off this thing, they'll they'll make a new little canary in the canary in the house mine for you to, to see how how bad the air quality is in your house. I don't know. This is this is probably one of the silliest design thing I've ever seen. But for you that, know, if it if if it helps, I guess. I mean, for that price, you can get like a real canary for cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, moving, moving on. If you have any feedback, questions, comments, picks of the week, or great ideas for a show or what pet to buy, uh, our email address is feedback at hometech.fm, or you can go to hometech.fm slash feedback and fill out the online form. Well, thanks, Gavin. That wraps up another uh, week in home tech. And we all know what pets we're all going to go buy now. That's great. Uh, you know, you got any big plans for this week? Uh, no, nothing planned up right now. You, you know, one of the things I've been focusing on my smart home lately is um, automation versus control. I know it's always a, a, a topic where... You know, people are like, oh, I have a smart home. And it's like, I can control all my switches. Well, that's just control. But you want like automation. So things to happen automatically. So I, I've been looking around trying to figure out where I can automate more and, and things like that. Like I already have like a few good automations where like, you know, it can detect when we're, no one's home and uh, automatically alarm the system and lock the doors and stuff. And that's actually harder than you really think it is to do. 
reliably, right? And I've been running it for a few years now. And I got really working using multiple different sensors, you know, and I just want to build up on that. You know, um, you know, I have some other automations where if you open a door for so long or a window for so long, it adjusts my thermostat, you know, to reduce, you know, us trying to cool down the whole neighborhood, things like that. So I've been focusing a lot more on automation these days and trying to see where I can automate more. You know, when it's invisible to the wife, one less thing for her to really uh, complain about me doing. Right. Right. I, I was thinking about the, this very topic just the other day um, to, to like the automation automated this automated side of the smart home that doesn't um really happen like we we have the controlled smart home like you can open and close your door locks or turn on and off your thermostat there's really not any automation automation based off that just like you were saying um but it would be interesting if we can get to a point one of these days where like what you were just talking about like the windows left open long enough adjust the thermostat automatically or like present something to the homeowner. I think there have been a couple of companies that have tried to do this in the past, like present an idea. So we're like, hey, um, we noticed this window is open for a long time and it gets kind of cool in this room and in the house when it's open. Why why don't you consider, you know, why don't we just turn off the air conditioner at this if, if that happens in the future? Um and and give you like a real easy like in English or in language way of describing what's happening. Um, where it, uh, it's kind of tough to do that because it like okay you're gonna go into this like complicated weird mumbo jumbo of like oh this automation got suggested to me I think like Siri does that too yeah and I think Amazon there was another, does it too there was another there was another like third party thing that was doing it but they got bought out um, I even think Josh AI did something like that didn't it too no it wasn't Josh AI it was it was another like uh, DIY like tie like you know me maybe. They, they were tying everything together. I think they, they had some kind of like suggestion engine. So you could like, you, you would tie all your devices into it, but then it would be like, Hey, you've got this and this, why don't we do this? Oh, okay. Um, so I think it was pretty basic, but you know, a, as we get down the road, I think it would be interesting to contemplate how that happens. Like what, what idea. And it, it, what, what the thing is, is like, it's going to be regional, right? If I leave my door open here, um, it, it, it the result is much different than if you leave your your door window open where you are right <laughs> like, yeah in the winter so <laughs> yeah yeah exactly in the, in the winter you get a snow drift uh, and i just get Pipes maybe 70 th- 70 degree yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> um so yeah it, it it's an interesting it's an interesting thought and 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 process is like what what all that means and all the inputs and everything that have to go into it to make those decisions. I mean, it's almost like it has to figure out how to make a human decision of what may be comfortable or what may be automation. Um, or at least get you in the ballpark, you know, to where you can make, Oh, that's a pretty good idea. Or no, that's dumb. Like, don't, don't tell me about this again. You know, you have to be able to tell it that. And then it has to be able to learn from that and either suggest more or less things based on what you, uh, what you want to try to get done in the house? I don't know. It, it seems like the next goal for a smart house but we can't seem to get like matter up and going so i don't know how this this is going to work either and there's a (laughs) few other barriers to automating things like this like um you know room uh occupancy detection isn't hasn't been great either so things like that once they fix those things then you can make the automation part of it so much better um you know like it's not easy because i have like scenes that kick off at different parts of the day but then i have to have logic in to say Okay, if no one's home, don't do this. If someone's home, then do this piece of it. You know, it gets more complicated at that point. But I, I've been working on a lot more of that to make it more seamless. Like the less we have to do, um, the better it is. That's what the whole point of this is, is to make things easier. Right, right. And you want to get to that lifestyle programming. Like you want to get that done so the the house actually fits in with you. And then like this is the thing, like when you sell your house, right? taking like Richard has a pretty good example of like what happened to him, like taking all of, all of that, like you're starting over. And so you got to retrain the next, you know, system to, to work the way you want it to. There's all sorts of like pitfalls in this, right? Like do do you, maybe you move into a house that doesn't have those room occupancy sensors or lighting control, like the suggestions and things that can do are going to be different and it's going to have to learn. It's almost like it has to be built in at the house level. And then it's like, Oh, I, I am the house and now I have new I have new 
owners. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I have, to, I have to learn what they like, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and then maybe you have like a little profile that you take along with you and plug in, you know, USB, you plug it into the, your breaker box or something. And it reads your profile and it says, oh, I see that you like it at um, 75 degrees and not 78 like the previous homeowners did. So I, I, it'd, be, it'd be interesting. It's it, it, it could be a fun like that, that would be the long term goal is to have the house or building learn or, or be built around what your preferences are um, from day one rather than having to like train all this stuff and put it all into like different ecosystems. Amazon's going to know this thing about me. Apple's going to know this. Google's going to know this. It'd be, it'd be nice if it was all kind of all brought together somehow. And, and I, I hate to say it, but like standardized, you know, to where the breaker box company could put a USB stick on it. And that's, that's how you import your profile into the house. And everybody just reads off that profile and can write information back to it. Be nice. That actually yeah. sounds like a cool idea, but something way in the future. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Way, way, way down, down the road. road. Yeah. 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 <laughs> i'm seeing usb it's like usb is not going to exist i mean exactly i'm yeah. going to tap my like uh sensor that's embedded in my end right and it right. will know i'm here and know what to do and it'll all be part of a cloud service that you have to pay monthly for or your lights don't work there you go all right we want to give a big thank you to everyone who supports this show but especially those who are able to financially support the show through our patreon page if you don't know about that head on over to hometech.fm slash support to learn how you can support Home Tech for as little as a dollar a month. Any pledge over $5 a month gets you a big shout out here on the show, but every pledge uh, gets you an invite over to the private Slack chat, The Hub, where you can and other supporters of the show can gather every day and talk about testing Ethernet cables. I mean, it seems like a great conversation. To, actually, it was more interesting than I thought. Like, they've been going with this, this $1,500 fluke tester that doesn't actually test cables, which I thought was interesting. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that could be a problem. If you got one of those fluke meters, like, uh, if you test anything less than what, 10 meters, I think is what's the, that's in the instructions that no one reads, uh, yeah. it's not guaranteed to be accurate. And there's a picture of a fluke meter passing a cable that is just ripped apart and put together by, by like wire. What are those, those Wago things? Those yeah. No, the clips that, well, um, join the wires, the Wago. Wago, yeah, Wago, Wago, whatever they are. Things. Yeah, little yeah. orange things. Yeah, they're just like the Cat5 is stripped for about like three feet, or I don't know, three feet, but like stripped for a good bit. And then they're just tied together with those clips and it passes on the Fluke multimeter because it is less than two meters. That's not a good thing. That's not a good no. thing. No. Yeah. But these are things you, you learn about in our uh, in the hub, right? Like these yeah. little things. Between that, the differences between Coke and, uh, you know, the latest Taco Bell conversations <laughs> we've been having. You know, all that just yeah. shows you you're miss what you're missing out on. The 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 entire, uh, yeah, the, 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 the hubs, um, Coke Starlight reviews are exclusive. We're not even going to talk. We're, <laughs> we're going to keep yep. that in there. <laughs> you got to you got to be part of the hub to know what what we think about Coke Starlight, Coke Starlight Zero. All right, all right. If you uh, if you want to help with the show but can't support financially, I uh, totally understand. We just appreciate a five star review on iTunes or positive rating in the podcast app of your choice. It really helps people find the show. And with that, that wraps up another week in home tech. For everyone here, have a great weekend, and we will see you next week. Take care. <laughs>